I want to invite you to open up the Word of God, if you have it, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as Brother Jeff said, we're going to look at verses 17 through 21. It's a privilege to serve <clears throat> Sin St. Louis as the city missionary. Uh, as Brother Jeff said, our, our family in July of 2012 moved uh, from Memphis, Tennessee to Toronto, Ontario. And uh, we were a part of a church there, and uh, it was, it's our home church called Collierville First Baptist Church. And the pastor there is my mentor, a spiritual father, pastor, friend, Chuck Herring. And Pastor Chuck said, Matt, I want you to take a year, and I want you to try to get as many people from Collierville First Baptist as you can to go with you to start this church in Toronto. And I was like, awesome, let's do it. And so after a year of brilliant vision casting and inviting and uh, coffees and meals and all that stuff. I had five people that was ready to go to Toronto, Ontario with me. The only problem was we all shared the same last name. It was Hess. And so the only people I could get to go to Canada with me was my family. And so my wife and our three children at the time, now we have four, uh, moved to Toronto. And, and I can just tell you this, God was faithful and he is faithful. And I pray that tonight, as we sit under the preaching of the Word of God and as we learn, that we will remember God's faithfulness as we talk about what it means to live our lives on mission. I want to share a story with you that I heard this week, and it just was crazy. And I said, man, I, I, I got to share this. It's by the, the man by the name of Larry Walters, and Larry was 33 years old, and he lived in the Los Angeles, California area. And he was bored one day, and he decided that he wanted a different perspective of his community, of his neighborhood. And so he went down to the Army Surplus store, and he bought 45 weather balloons. Weather balloons have been in the news a lot lately. And he went to the Army Surplus store. He bought 45 weather balloons. He tied them to a lawn chair, and his friends put helium in them and all those things. And this was Larry's plan. He had a six-pack of beer a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and a BB gun. And when he started to elevate, he was going to shoot the balloons down one by one, and so if he got up too high. So his plan was to get to 100 feet, but Larry didn't get to 100 feet. He got to 1,100 feet up off the ground, and he found himself in air traffic space of LAX. He was too petrified to shoot the balloons down when he kept on climbing higher and higher. Shut down airports all over the country. Delayed flights all over the country. Three questions the police asked Larry when he got down. Number one, were you scared? Larry said, yes. Number two, would you do it again? Larry said, no. Question number three, why did you do it? And he said this, because you just can't sit there. So many people in our society share the same sentiment as Larry Walters. They are bored with their lives, so they're doing stupid things. They are dissatisfied with their lives, so they are causing hurt and pain to those whom they love around them. They are frustrated with their lives, so they're making poor decisions. They're unhappy with their lives, but at the core root of all of those things is this. They are restless. They are restless. Now, the question we have to ask is this. Why is the majority of our society today restless with their lives? And I would say that it is this. They do not have purpose for their lives. They're asking questions like, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Where am I supposed to go to college? What am I supposed to do for a career? Am I supposed to go into the trades? Am I supposed to be a doctor? Am I supposed to be a plumber? What am I supposed to do with my life? And if that's you tonight, I would suggest that you are asking the wrong question. You see, because while we rack our brains trying to figure out exactly what we're supposed to do with our lives, God already has a plan for our lives. What is God's plan for our lives? The Westminster Shorter Catechism was written years ago in the 1600s. It's comprised of 107 questions that's intended to summarize the Christian faith. 
And the very first question asked this question is this What is the chief end of man? Of course, the answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. You see, we are racking our minds trying to figure out what we're supposed to do with our lives. And God says in His Word, I've created you to bring me glory. I've created you to enjoy me. I've, I've created you to live on purpose. That's why we exist. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Romans eleven thirty six. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now there are many ways with which we bring God glory to our lives. We can bring God glory to our, our lives by honoring him in our workplace. We can bring God glory in our lives by honoring him in the classroom. We can bring God glory in many different ways. But specifically tonight, I want us to see that we bring God glory when we live our lives on mission. When we live our lives on mission. And the next logical question is this. How do we live our lives on missions in this world? How do we show the love of Christ to our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers? There's all kinds of ways you can show the love of Christ to others. When you carry your trash down to the end of the driveway, you can pick up your neighbor's trash. Where we just now move from in Toronto, Canada, everybody shares one driveway, so you have a house. Everybody's packed in there like sardines because of the population. So you have a house, house, driveway, that everybody shares, and then house, house. So you, the driveways are wedged between the homes. And so when we would go out to shovel our snow, we would ask and help our neighbors shovel their snows. And everybody in the block would, would shovel snow for one another. And we should be doing constantly good deeds, passing out bottles of water on a hot summer day, going on a mission trip like, like you are here today. All these good deeds, though, are, are valuable and they are good, but we like to say this, good deeds must always lead to good news. There are a lot of people in this world that are doing good deeds. The Christian church does not have the market cornered on doing nice things for the fellow, their fellow man. But what separates the church from the world is that we do good deeds, yes, in the name of Jesus, but we ultimately do good deeds to proclaim good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But statistics tell us that 98% of professing Christians do not share their faith on a regular basis. I was preaching a conference once, and I shared that statistic and a well-meaning, good-hearted brother came up to me afterwards, and he said, Matt, I, I just can't believe that statistic. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Who did you share the gospel with this past week? And he said, uh, nobody. And I said, who did you share the gospel with last week? And he said, nobody. I said, who did you share the gospel with this month? And he said, nobody. I said, who did you share the gospel with last month? And he got real quiet and put his head down and said, Nobody. And I said, do you believe the statistic now? 98% of the church in North America are not actively living their lives on mission. Often when we talk about living on mission, we get into the how. And we oftentimes as pastors and as, as church planners and as leaders, we think it, it, people, our people just need to know the how more. You just need another tool to put in your belt. You just need another lesson on how to share the gospel. How can we get more engaged with church planning, international missions, missions, etc.? But, but can I just be honest with you tonight? I, I don't think that's the problem. I think resources and tools are good, but, but I don't think that's the problem. We have enough resources that will teach the bride of Christ how to live on mission, how to share the gospel, how to engage your community with Jesus. I don't think it's the how that's the problem. I think oftentimes we forget the who. And tonight I want to remind us of who we are in Christ and it is through him alone that propels us 
to live our lives on mission for Christ. Our text, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Within these six verses are discovered some of the richest, most beautiful truths in in all of Scripture. In them, we discover four facts about who we are in Christ Jesus and how our identity in Christ empowers us to live our lives on mission. That's our goal tonight. By the time we finish here in a few moments, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will take these four truths and seal them in your heart. And as we walk out these doors later, we will say, this is the calling God has placed on every single blood-bought child of his. First, tonight, you can live your life on mission when you understand that you are a new person. You are a new person. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Man, I got good news to tell you tonight. If you have repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Christ alone, by faith alone, in grace alone, you are a brand new person. The Bible says that the old things have passed away. Now, I still struggle with flesh. The Bible says that the the spirit and the flesh war against one another. Can I get a witness? Anybody? Amen. So sometimes those old things will try to get back in. But the Bible says, the authoritative word of God says, we are new People, the old man has died and we've been crucified with Christ. And this is what Paul tells us here as well. The old things have passed away. What were the old things that have passed away before you began a personal relationship with Christ? If we were to go around this room tonight, they are different for every single one of us, aren't they? The sins that you struggle with before you came to Christ, they may not be the same things that I struggle with. The things that I struggled with before I came to Christ may not be the same sins that you struggle with. Anger was a deep struggle with me. Had constant anger, constant rage, identity, confidence, addiction, religion. Now, all of these things are bad. All of these things are great struggles. But there is one primary reason why we could have cared less about others' spiritual conditions before we began a relationship with Christ. You know what it was? We were selfish. We were selfish. Why did we have no desire to share the love of Christ with people before we became Christians? Because we were selfish people. Now, here's... The rub. Now, as Christ's followers, we are willing to be rejected as we share the love of Christ. We should be willing to get out of our comfort zones as we engage people with the gospel. We are possibly even willing to lose our lives for the sake of the gospel as we see our brothers and sisters who are being martyred all around the world tonight, even as we speak, for the sake of the gospel. Why is this? Paul says new things have come. New things. We may have read the Bible before we became Christ's followers, but now when we read it, it's alive. We may have noticed creation before as we walked through the woods or on a trail and said, wow, it's a beautiful day. It's a great day. But now every squirrel we see, every flower that's growing, every leaf that's blowing on an autumn day, every snowflake that drops screams the glory of God. We see life from a different perspective because we're new people. We may have experienced happiness, 
before we met Jesus, when we got a pay raise or when we met a, a girl as men, it kind of made us a flutter a little bit in our hearts. So, or opposite, when a girl met a guy, kind of, oh, that could be my man, right? Like, we get kind of happy. Or when Friday came along and we were like, the weekend's coming, and we got kind of happy. But now what do we have? Now, because we're new creatures, we have true joy. And our circumstances don't paint the full picture of our joy because Christ paints the full picture of our joy. Not how much money is in our bank account, not what kind of car we drive or any of those things. Why? Because we're new. New things have come. The author of this book, Paul, he, he was a great example of understanding new things. Before he became Paul, he was, of course, Saul. And he persecuted Christians with the same kind of passion that he's now planting churches. But he's a new person in Christ. God radically got a hold of his heart. He was converted, surrenders his life fully to Jesus, and is Credited with writing 13 books of the New Testament, known as one of the greatest men of God to ever walk with God. Why? Because God changed his heart. And if you're here tonight as a Christ follower, you're a new creature. You're a new person because God changed your heart. After Paul's conversion, he started to look differently at people. He started to look differently at the world. One commentator says this, and I quote, now the shadow of Christ's cross fell across his view every time he looked at other people. He saw believers as new creations in Christ and unbelievers as people in need of Christ. This perspective shaped his ministry. This commentator says when Paul walked around, he saw two groups of people, those who were in Christ Jesus and those who had rejected Christ Jesus. And he lived his life on mission with a zeal to, to see conversions. Why? Because God had converted his heart. God has changed his heart. And we're talking tonight about living our lives on mission. And I just want to take you back tonight to the moment that you got on your knees or the moment you were quiet in your car or wherever it was that the Spirit of God came and transformed you. And he converted you and he changed you and he took you from darkness and he placed you into light. You're a new person in Christ. Don't let the enemy trick you and lie to you and convince you that you're not. How can you reach the world for Christ? Because you are a new person with new motives. And before we move on tonight, let me just ask you, are you living like it? Are you living like a new person? Or do you find yourself kind of wandering back into your old life? Do you find yourself kind of being drifted back into the old things that God says, I've taken those things away and I've made you a new person? Tonight, let the Holy Spirit search your heart through his word. Secondly, you can live your life on mission tonight. Not only because we are new people, but because you've been given a new position. Theologically, you now are in right standing with God, what we just sang about. Look at verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Wow. Do you see that, friends? That's a miracle right there. Everybody today is obsessed with miracles, healings, and these kinds of things. And God works wonders, and God can do whatever he chooses to do. But nothing that happens in this world is greater than this miracle right here. That God would send his son Jesus, and through the blood of Christ, we are made righteous with a holy, perfect God. That's what Paul is saying. We have a new position. That's the gospel. You see, an incredible exchange took place. When Christ went on the cross and died at Calvary, we didn't care about people's spiritual conditions before we became Christ followers because we ourselves weren't Christ followers. Tonight, I just want to tell you, I was a false convert for years. I preached the gospel for six years 
had a Bible degree. I was licensed. I was ordained. I got out of the Marine Corps in 2004, went back to Oklahoma, started to try to lead my life, came home from Iraq. And for three years, from 2004 to 2007, I wrestled greatly with my salvation. I, I did not look like a Christian. I did not feel like a Christian. And in secret, I did not act like a Christian. But I was preaching in churches. I was doing revivals. I was traveling, all these kinds of things. And I would go to people and I'd say, go to leaders that I respected and I'd share with them some of these concerns. And they'd say, oh, people get saved, you know, when you preach and all these kinds of things. Surely you're a Christian. But I wasn't. And in 2007, after preaching for six years, serving on staff at a large church, I gave my life to Christ for real. It was genuinely born again. Now, why do I share that with you tonight? Because all of the other things that I, were do, I was doing, trying to obtain righteousness, trying to get to God, trying to be good, none of that stuff was going to make me right with a righteous God. It is only by the blood of Christ that we come to God. In a world that is trying to water down truth, in a world that is constantly pushing against truth and trying to say, well, there could be multiple ways. There could be multiple options. Jesus says, no, 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 no. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through the Son. And here's the beautiful piece. When you've repented of your sins, you become a new person, and now you've got a new position. Now the Bible says that you are uh, uh, able to call Christ Lord, but Jesus calls us what? Friend. That is a miracle that he would save us. He took away our sins and he gives us this new strength. Now let me ask you a question tonight before we move on. If you are a professing Christian, if you have repented of your sins, place your faith in Jesus do you see yourself as in Christ? Do you see yourself theologically as in Christ, justified through his righteousness? Do you see yourself that way? Oftentimes we don't. And there's one nasty little word that gets in the way in our minds and in our heart when we don't see ourselves as in Christ. You know what that word is? Feelings. Feelings. Well, I don't really feel like a Christian. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. You want to tell them they're number one. You don't really feel like a Christian, do you? Somebody is rude to you at work and you have this rage or anger in your heart and you don't really feel like a Christian. And you read the Beatitudes and you hear the Sermon on the Mount and you're like, man, I want some of that, but I ain't living any of that. You don't feel like a Christian. Can I just tell you if, you, if you insist on following your feelings as a follower of Jesus, instead of following this book, you will never mature in your relationship with Christ. Martin Luther, the great reformer, says this, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. It's not about how we feel. It's about what Christ has done. It's not about whether or not you feel very saved today. It's about who have you trusted in for your salvation. Your new position in Christ has absolutely nothing to do with the way you and I feel, but rather about what Jesus has done. We don't live our lives on mission because we oftentimes do not understand our position theologically. You have access to Christ tonight. If you are in Jesus, you have position to live your life on mission. How can you love this world and live on mission with your life? Because you're new people. Because you have a new position in Christ. And finally tonight, you can go to this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ because you have a new purpose. Look at verses 18 through 20. 
Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Have you ever heard of that saying before? This is when the rubber hits the road. It means like this is what this is really all about. And what Paul is saying here is this is what this text is about. You have a new purpose. Because you are a new person, because you have new position, you have a new purpose for your life. Your purpose is not just to wake up and see how much money you can make someday. Your purpose is not just to see how many degrees you can get with your name printed on it. Your purpose is not just to have some fabulous career. Your purpose is not just to make a big legacy and indent in this world because you invented something or whatever it might be. Your purpose is to live for the glory of Christ. That's what Paul says. Paul says this is why you were created. Look at what verse 18 says. He goes even further. Paul says that Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You know what that means right there? It means that every single follower of Jesus Christ has the responsibility, and might I add, the privilege to share the gospel with a broken, hurt, and dying world. And then notice verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That word ambassador, it's a beautiful word. Like I told you, we moved to Toronto in, in, in uh, 2012, and we were surprised. All, we had three kids moving to Toronto. Three of, they were all three born in Memphis. And then we moved to Toronto, and we had our Canadian baby. Her name is Cadence. And uh, Cadence was born in Toronto, and somebody one day in conversation with said, said to uh, my wife and I, hey, have you guys claimed her American citizenship? And we were like, claimed her American citizenship? I'm American, like, Eric is American. What do you mean claim her? And she, they said, yeah, you have to go down to the embassy, and you have to claim her American citizenship, or she'll just be Canadian and we didn't want her to be an outcast in the family. So we, we went down to the embassy, and uh, we claimed her American citizenship. And Cadence is seven now. She's our sophisticated world traveler. She's a dual citizen. She's got an American passport and a Canadian passport, and we're going to ride her coattails. If it ever really hits the fan in America, we're going to go to Canada, and she's going to sponsor us, and we'll get their free health care again. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> When you go to an embassy, there is an ambassador that lives there. And that ambassador represents what? The country. And what Paul is telling us here tonight is that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are ambassadors. But we don't represent America. We don't represent Canada. We don't represent, and you feel in whatever nation you want to on the face of this planet. If you are in Christ Jesus tonight, you represent the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you represent a whole different kind of country. You represent the kingdom of God. And what Paul is saying is, are you living your life as a minister of reconciliation? Are you living your lives as ambassadors for the glory of God? Or, when the world sees you, they just see somebody else. You look like the world, you think like the world, you act like the world, you talk like the world. And because we have no convictions and because we're not living our lives on mission, we make up foolish things and say, well, we just do all that to reach the world. And all the while, you will not find that missiological philosophy in missional philosophy in Scripture. 1 John says that we are to be separate from the world. We're in the world, but separate from the world. That means that our minds are aligned to the things of the word of God. Our lives are aligned with the truths of scripture, not with what the world teaches us. While at the same time, we cannot hate 
the mission field. And so it's been wild being up in Canada the past six, seven years looking down on America. And there are people in the evangelical world who say they love the world. And yet it seems like they hate the world, but they want to reach the world. And it just doesn't really add up. So my question to us tonight is this. How are we doing with our ambassador responsibilities? Are we the weirdos that people look at us and like, man, they, that person's different. They, they don't spend money the same way I spend money. They don't even look at money the same way I look at money. Like, uh, they don't look at popularity the same way I look at popularity. They don't look at relationships the same way I look at relationships. Are we being weird in a way that honors Christ and yet doesn't push the world away from us? Are we serving as ambassadors for Christ? He said, well, Matt, I, I'm not sure if that's what God wants for me. Maybe that's for Pastor Josh or Pastor Andy or Brother Jeff or whoever it is that you respect and look to as ministerial leadership. I just want to bring you back to our text tonight. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you do not get to abdicate these responsibilities. You do not get to say, well, that's for others, but yet it's not for me. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, what do we call that? The Great Commission. That's a command. We call it the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion for a reason. Because when our king gives us edicts, the only choice we have to do is obey. Well, we don't get to say, well, I'm not so sure about that. No, no, no. We represent his kingdom. We obey his commands. Did you notice what Paul says after he says we're ambassadors? He says three things to complete our passage tonight. The first thing he says is this in verse 20. We are God's mouthpieces. As though God were making an appeal through us. Some people take this passage and look at it and say, well, sure, but that was the Apostle Paul talking. I mean, that's the Apostle Paul. Nobody can share the gospel like the Apostle Paul. But if you are, again, a follower of Jesus, then you are God's mouthpiece. 1 Peter 4.11 Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Toronto, I'll never forget this. One time I had a friend in, in the church and said, Pastor, I want you to come and I want you to share the gospel with, with all my friends and family members. That sounds great, doesn't it? But it's also kind of weird. Because there's this thing called relational equity. See, I have relationships and friendships with people that you do not know. And you have relationships and friendships with people that I do not know. And for you to try to just instantly invade my circle of influence and, and share the gospel, it can be kind of awkward. Now, the Spirit can do what the Spirit does. And likewise, if I just try to go right into your circle and try to impose my views, it can be a little bit awkward. See, my my, my plan is this. My, my thoughts are this. It's God's design to use you. It's God's plan to use you to reach the lost people in your life. Why? Because he has sovereignly placed you. He has strategically placed you for such a time as this to bring people into the kingdom of God. Secondly, we are to passionately plead with people we are to passionately plea with people. What does Paul say? We beg you on behalf of Christ. Well, I don't want to be too pushy. Ugh. I don't want to be too pushy. Can I just tell you tonight? Hell is real. And the Bible says it's hot. And the Bible says it's eternal damnation. And Christ 
spoke infinitely more about hell than he ever did heaven. There is too much at stake for us to say things like, I don't want to offend anybody. And we use that as an excuse to step away from the mission of God. We are to passionately plead with people. Like their lives actually depend on it because you know what? It does. It does. When people leave this world, they will either spend eternity with Christ in his kingdom or in hell separated from a holy, perfect, righteous God forever. And I think oftentimes in the West and particularly the church in North America, we stop talking about those things because they may not be so popular, but they are and they always will be very biblical. We must passionately plead with people. Can I ask you this tonight? What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about your 401k? We're trying to find a house right now. And in the six months that we've been here, watching the interest rates continue to climb, I'll tell you what, it's hard not to be too passionate about following that. We're passionate about football. We're passionate about basketball. We're passionate about March Madness. We're passionate about sports. We're passionate about our kids. We get more passionate about our kid or our toddler hitting a ball off of a little tee that's just sitting there and we scream and holler and then we come into church and we're just so quiet, reserved and, and we're, we're not passionate about the things that God tells us to be passionate about. We're not passionate about the lost people all around us. Paul says, passionately plead with people to come to Christ. We beg you on behalf of Christ. Every single one of us in this room tonight that are in Christ, we have family members and friends that do not know Jesus. Does it hurt our hearts? Does it keep us up at night? Do we fast for these souls? Do we weep for these souls? Do we by faith pray and believe that God will usher them into the kingdom? Or is apathy saturated and quenched that fire to see them born again? Thirdly, we are to ask and then leave the results up to God. Early in my ministry when I would preach, I remember getting in the car and being discouraged if we didn't see what I perceived to be any kind of real movement of God in that moment. And I remember there was just a moment in my ministry where I realized all of this has very little to do with me. <laughs> we are to ask and then leave the results up to God. What does he say? Be reconciled to God. Since Paul had to appeal to others to be reconciled, he, he did not believe that the work of Christ automatically reconciled every single human being to God. That's called universalism. Well, everybody's going to come to Christ. Everybody's going to be saved. Everybody's going to be okay. No. That's not what the Bible teaches. Christ's saving work on the cross is sufficient but it is effective only for those who repent and call on the name of Christ as Lord. Those who hear the gospel are responsible to believe in Christ in order to become reconciled to God. How do we live on mission for Christ? Understand that you are a new person. Understand that theologically we are in a new position. And now you have a new purpose. You say, Matt, that's awesome. Praise God. I believe all that. But I've heard sermons like this before. And if I'm being honest, they're more discouraging than encouraging. Because if 98% of the church do not actively share their faith, like count me in that number. I'm in that 98%. Let's just assume that. So you say, so I'm about to say hi to my friends and stuff, and I'm going to get in my car, and I'm going to go home or get on the bus or walk or whatever it may be. However you get back to your house, and you're going to kind of feel like a loser later because you know that you're not really going to change anything. I want to share with you, and I want to remind you tonight that we are new people 
with a new position and a new purpose. But I want to remind you of this. We've also been given a new power. And this power is the Holy Spirit of God. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can do nothing that will build the kingdom of God. See, I wasn't brought up Baptist. I was brought up in a heretical movement near Tulsa, Oklahoma called the Word of Faith Movement. Have you heard of that before? It's the name it and claim it. It's her heretical. It's poison to our society. And the sad thing about it is some of the biggest names and preachers today come from the Word of Faith Movement. It's called the Prosperity Gospel. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy. If you're not those things, then you're doing something wrong. I grew up in that. I was brought up in that. But I will tell you this. The one thing that charismatics are not afraid of is the Holy Spirit. Now, where they get it wrong is they perverse the Holy Spirit a lot. But as I came to grow and to learn and all of, of those things, I realized I had to make a shift in my theology. I had to make a shift in my thinking when it came to the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you tonight a story. Get out of the Marine Corps, praying for God to give me a ministry. Got my brand new wife, childhood sweetheart. Eric and I met. She was 14. I was 16. We dated for seven years and got married. Got this little house in Claremore, Oklahoma. We're asking the Lord, give us a ministry, you know, just praying. One day, I'm selling cell phones at, in Cricket in Tulsa and uh, go to my next door neighbor. I want to introduce myself to him because you know, I'm going to be traveling a lot back and forth and whatnot and wanted Erica just to know she could go next door if she needed anything. So I go next door, introduce myself to this guy. His name's Pastor Terry Lawson introduced myself. He says, what do you do, man? I said, just got out of the Marine Corps, selling cell phones. I'm a big time cell phone salesman down at Cricket, Tulsa. And uh, so we get to talk and I said, but I really, my heart is to preach. I want to preach. He said, really? He said, well, I'm a preacher. I said, oh, really? He said, yes. And we're looking for a youth pastor and a youth slash associate pastor at a church that I pastor. I said, awesome. I said, well, let's talk, man. Long story short, we come on staff there. So a lot of pros and cons of being next door neighbors with your senior pastor as a young youth pastor. And uh, part of my responsibilities was to preach a lot on Sunday nights. And I preached a sermon. And that following Monday, what I would do is I would sit with Brother Terry, the pastor, and we would talk. And he would show me some things, you know, that I said or preached on or whatever. And I would just ask for feedback. To, I wanted to grow as a young preacher. And he said, oh, Matt, that sermon, sit down, man. He got me coffee. Sit down, man. That sermon last night was awesome. And uh, he said, it was so good. You said this, you said that. It went on for a few minutes. But then he said, but. And then I, my heart kind of sunk. I was like, uh-oh. He said, Matt, I don't, I don't even think you, re you realize you did this. But you kept referencing the Holy Spirit as it. You kept referencing the Holy Spirit as a thing. Brother Terry was brought up, that was a Southern Baptist church, but he was brought up as a fundamentalist, independent Baptist, King James Version only Baptist. That's going to matter in just a moment what I'm about to say to you. He looks me in the eyes and he says, Matt, the Holy Spirit is not an id. The Holy Spirit is not on a nefarious cloud floating somewhere. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. Matt, the Holy Spirit is a full-fledged member of the Holy Trinity of God. The Holy Spirit is God. And without his power, Matt, you cannot preach sermons. You cannot raise a family. You cannot do anything for the glory of God. wrecked me. And what happened was for the next three years, 
that moment led me to begin to investigate what I really believed about this book and about the God who I said was my savior that ultimately led to my salvation. See, what I had done was, because I was brought up with so much bad theology around the Holy Spirit, I overcorrected all the way to the other side. And oftentimes what we do is we say, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Bible. And we just kind of leave the Holy Spirit out of things. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches, in order to do what? To live lives that glorify God. See, you hear this sermon and you think, I'm going to go and share the gospel more. Man, just line me up. Where do I go? Knock on doors and tell people about Jesus, right? You and I ain't going to do a thing without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And you know oftentimes why we do not share the gospel? Because we're not anointed with his power. We're not asking for his power. We're not being led by his power. And we think that there's something about us that's going to be winsome to get people to Jesus, to get people to the church. And without the work of the Spirit of God in their lives, friends, listen to me, it's impossible. My family's life verse is John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do some nice things. Does it say that? Some good things. You can do some stuff, but not a lot of good stuff. It doesn't say that. It says nothing. You can do nothing. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives in order to glorify God and to live our lives on mission. Beloved, don't be discouraged tonight that you're not doing these things. Repent that you're not doing these things. Confess that you're not doing these things. Just a moment as Pastor Andy's gonna come and lead us through the Lord's Supper, we take communion. Remember that it is through the broken body of Christ and the shed blood of our King that empowers and enables you to live a life on mission. Not because you're a good little Christian. We need Jesus, we need his power. You remember how we started tonight? With that knucklehead that sat in the chair and the balloons that lifted him up. Do you remember the answer to his third question? The police asked him, were you scared? Yes. Would you do it again? No. Why did you do it? Remember his response? He said, because you just can't sit there. you got to do something with this word tonight. And my prayer is that it would be a moment in your life. There are a lot of young people in this life, in this room. What are you going to do with your life? You can't just sit there. And I don't care what age we are. You can't just sit there. If you're here tonight and you've never repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, do so tonight. Let tonight be the night of your salvation. Why not tonight? Why not be born again tonight? Why not trust in the King of kings and Lord of lords? Repent. I don't care if you grew up in church. I don't care how religious religious you think you are. Trust in Christ as your Lord. But if you're in this room tonight and you are in Christ and you're not obeying the Great Commission and you're not living your life on mission, let the Holy Spirit convict and speak and take the next few moments to examine your heart, and let the Spirit of God correct you, rebuke you, teach you. You know why he does those things? Because he loves us.